Oh, yeah. uh, can you hear me okay, Colonel? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Hear Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for today's AIWA Los Angeles Las Vegas section, uh, E-Town Hall meeting. Uh, was, uh, today we have a very exciting topic and a very distinguished speaker, so stay tuned. Um, but before that, we have a few words and uh, a few words and uh, logistics. Uh, sorry, we kind of got late a little bit, but don't worry about it. We will uh, catch up. Uh, we have uh, time uh, today. So first of all, we thank AIWA headquarters, national office for providing this, this wonderful Zoom platform, which is actually quite expensive, but it's uh, very, very nice, uh, it's very helpful. And uh, this session, as you just heard, is being recorded thanks to the speaker, give the permission. Um, if anything happened to the session, please try to reconnect because sometimes the internet issue temporary, you just keep trying to reconnect, it should be fine. Um, please sign in the Zoom with your real name because it use, use some device name or something, nobody knows who you are and it's very difficult to, for, to interact. And if you, you are in the attendee, if you don't type something, ask question, no one knows you are in the audience. So, uh, but if you want that people know you are here, you know, you type something, say hello or something like that. And uh, during the pre presentation and also in the Q&A session, um, please try to use the Q&A box instead of using chat. Uh, to type your question. And uh, at the end of the, pre uh, the, the, uh, the event, after presentation, uh, you are welcome to click raise hand, uh, then you will be unmuted to speak out your question. Uh, it, it can be more interactive that way. So the speaker can hear and uh, discuss with you. Um, so just a few words for local uh, Southern California. Uh, it, you, uh, as you know, is very vibrant in aerospace activities, and uh, we have, you know, uh, sustainable aviation companies. Uh, then we have, um, you know, SpaceX, of course, just right next door. Virgin Galactic, Virgin Orbit, Aerospace Corporation, Northrop Grumman, uh, you know, building the James Webb Space Telescope. Then, of course, the JPL, uh, this uh, Mars 2020 Perseverance Mars Helicopter and uh, so on and so forth, and the many uh, great university student branches like USC, uh, UCLA, Cal State Long Beach, you know, UNLV. And uh, the key part uh, for AIWA is actually networking. Participation is highly welcome, engaged, uh, encouraged, and it's very important. So we keep doing events. Uh, in real person event, we actually have networking hours, but online people generally tend to just listen to uh, listen to the uh, uh, the presentation. Um, sorry for this. So the uh, so one of the advantage of joining Engage uh, AIWA membership is that uh, you can you can uh, hear the um, <clears throat> uh, participate in the online community like AIWA Engage. The engage will allow you to connect to other uh, members in the community. Uh, then you can uh, you can chat with them, post your question, those kinds of things. And another good feature for you join to join the uh, AIWA is, is the uh, daily lunch. You will be able to receive the uh, up to date news, and uh, sometimes you even get business you know out of this because it, it, some exciting opportunity show up. And uh, another big advantage is the uh, Aerospace America, uh, which is a very good uh, a magazine and full of uh, very insightful information. And, uh, and then you got discount, you know, huge discount, you know, for attending uh, AWA forums and conferences. It's a very big uh, benefit for AWA members. Uh, for online, you save a little bit, but for in-person uh, forum, you save a lot. And uh, different level of membership, and for educator is free. And uh, for students, if you uh, just keep in mind, uh, if you, uh, uh, after student membership, there's a student professional transition rate you can see at the bottom. Uh, so it's a very good, uh, you know, uh, feature to, to take advantage, you know, uh, save a lot. And uh, one very important, uh, very exciting feature is, is, is for AIDA membership is you can advance you know, uh, along your uh, uh, career. And uh, so just mention your student to professional transition, it become the member. And uh, then as it goes, it becomes senior member. 
And uh, you know, you can apply. Some people can nominate you, and you can advance, uh, become associate fellow, like our distinguished speaker today, Colonel. Uh, he's a associate fellow, and our former section chair from Boeing, Robert Friend, is uh, also associate fellow. And uh, the president of Virgin Galactic, uh, Mr. George Whiteside, is also associate fellow. Mr. Elon Musk is actually also our associate fellow. And then, you know, and that was, uh, if you like, you know, some people may not try to pursue in this track, but if you like, and uh, you can try to advance the next level. For example, our uh, section chair, Dr. Jeff Pushel of Raytheon, he is an AIW fellow. And also uh, uh, Miss Mary Lee Wheaton from Aerospace Corporation, Mr. Dan Raymer, and the president of Aerospace Corporation, Mr. Steve Izakowicz and the, the, the uh, Dr. Marty Bradley for sustainable, sustainable Aviation and Dr. Henry Garrett, these are fellows. Now, of course, if you are uh, interested in how then the, uh, somebody nominated you, got a reference, you can get higher level. The highest honor is level is honorary fellow. For example, the uh, uh, president and CEO of SpaceX right now is uh, Miss Queen Shutwell is uh, honorary fellow. And then the four-star general, the four uh, women in the Air Force uh, general is the, uh, Alan, General Ellen Polikowski. Uh, and the, of course, the beloved Buzz Aldrin, Neil Armstrong, and uh, Dr. Bill Gerstenmeier. And, uh, and also a few like Professor Jason Speyer, they're also honorary fellow. It's just a good example, you know, give you a lot of inspiration. And then we also recognize uh, people for years of uh, membership. For example, on uh, Thursday next next week, we are going to honor, uh, recognize the uh, uh, people with 25, 40, 60, and 70 years of membership. So please join us uh, to cheer for them. And uh, other than the uh, uh, honors, you know, there's uh, advancing rankings. We also have awards in different level for service, publication, best paper, educator, lectureship, many things. And this is one example. This is uh, uh, Dr. Paul Belivacqua is our AIW distinguished lecturer. Uh, he holds a patent and for his innovation for the veto uh, for F-35 and uh, is uh, Guggenheim Medal. Uh, so this is example. Another example is uh, this year, uh, Dr. Mishimasa Fujino, uh, CEO of the um, <clears throat> Honda aircraft, and he got AIW Reed uh, Award. Uh, so this is what AIW do actually you know, very regularly every year. And uh, you got the award dinner, Spotlight Award Gala. And uh, AIW also publish, and that's uh, also one of the very important feature. And of course the uh, STEM, you know, is one important part of AIW activities. And then we just have a new high school membership, which is free. And uh, AIW have national forums. Uh, these are the five flagship uh, forum conference. So please uh, uh, take a look. So uh, the, the, the next couple of slides, just uh, what we did recently, we are trying to do more on quantum computing. Uh, actually, it's has been highly connected to aerospace. Uh, Lockheed Martin, USC, many, Raytheon, many companies has joined, uh, start to use uh, quantum computer. And uh, we have Dr. Raymer designing the exciting Mars airplane. I got an international uh, collaboration and a volunteer. And we have JPL uh, people, you know, talking about the Europa Clipper. Uh, Colonel today is going to talk about uh, the nuclear engine for, for uh, you know, for, for many things, including the exciting Dragonfly. And uh, we have uh, Virgin Orbit, uh, just have, and you just see the news, the Virgin Galactic is going to launch the next crew flight uh, this weekend. And uh, we're Hi. talking about uh, green aviation. And uh, we just have an event on May 1st uh, to, for, to giving out the excellence award to the JPL team for Mars Helicopter, Ingenuity, and the Perseverance rover. So upper lab is our section chair, Dr. Jeff Michel, the Raytheon uh, chief scientist and AIW fellow. Lower lab is the leader uh, for the Ingenuity helicopters. And the, the lower right representative for the uh, uh, Mars, uh, <clears throat> the Perseverance EDL team. So upper right is the, our speaker, Jeff DeLong, for the, uh, uh, the talk about the helicopter. So this is a, a big achievement, accomplishment for the Wright Brothers field uh, near Jezero Crater on Mars. And uh, we have Professor Jakowski talking about terraforming Mars and climate change uh, on Mars and uh, climate and uh, atmosphere. Then we just have the 
happy hour event. <laughs> we have this uh, AWS Space Station gathering, and we have a uh, brilliant young student from Canada and using CAD design for advanced aircraft. And the people get together chatting about uh, commercial space or a new activity in space, enjoy the virtual space environment. And uh, on June 17, we are going to do it on the virtual uh, Mars space. Uh, you know, uh, again, it's going to be a new setting. It's going to be fun. Please join us. Uh, so today we really honor, you know, we, we kind of spend a little bit of time to talk about AIWA because that's very important. And that's why we are here gathering and uh, Colonel is uh, associate fellow. Uh, He's also, he's the owner of Chief Sign, uh, Chief uh, Engineer for uh, his company, uh, Shortest Engineering and Safety Consulting, providing expert nuclear, uh, aerospace and systems engineering consulting service to government, national laboratories, academia and the private industry since 1993. He founded his company immediately upon retiring from the Air Force after a distinguished 23, 23 years military career. Colonel has brought uh, technical and pro programmatic uh, experience in all life cycle aspects of advanced nuclear energy technologies and systems for space, missile, unique ter terrestrial applications. 40 years of his 50 year career to date have involved space nuclear power and propulsion technology systems, programs, and missions. He is internationally recognized as an expert in space nuclear system uh, their safety and the reliability and assessment of the risk associated with their validation testing launch in space use. He, has, uh, he also has extensive experience in program and uh, technical project management to include serving as program manager for the 700 million um, let me, joint DOD, DOE, NASA, SP100 space reactor power system development effort at DOD headquarters for the SDI. Uh, as well as leading, conducting, assessing numerous studies, analysis, evaluation, and reports, and uh, presenting the result to middle top management within DOD, um, NASA, DOE, NRC, EPA, and the national uh, academies, uh, and also the admission, administration, the White House, Congress, the United Nations. He has been involved in every US space nuclear system devel development since 1974 and every single US nuclear powered or heated space mission launched since 1975. That is a total of 50 missions, including Viking 1 and 2, uh, Lincoln Experimental Satellite, Satellite 8 and 9, Voyager 1 and 2, Galileo, Ulysses, Mars Pathfinder Soldier Rover, Cassini, Mars Exploration Rovers A and B, Spirit and Opportunity, uh, and New Horizons for Pluto, and also MSL Curiosity Rover and the Mars 2020 Perseverance Rover. Currently, he is supporting the advancement of radio, radio isotope and efficient power system for future space use, including conceptual design options for a new radio isotope uh, heat source using plutonium 238 uh, oxide microsphere particle fuel, for, and for a JPL ferrobot concept uh, to penetrate the ice sheets of Europa and Enceladus. Uh, and explore their liquid ocean beneath in the future. He recently completed particip participation in the one-year National Ac Academy's committee study of space nuclear propulsion technologies for NASA cargo missions and the first crew mission to Mars in the 20s, uh, 2020s. He's a former NRC licensed super, uh, senior reactor operator, uh, reactor facility director, director of the uh, United States Air Force Nuclear Regulatory Authority. And he's also an inventor who conceived conceive of an advanced uh, plutonium 238 oxide coated particle fuel and fuel forms to improve the design, integration, performance, and safety of future radioisotope heat sources and the power systems for space and the remote terrestrial applications. He received a bachelor's degree in nuclear uh, science engineering from Penn State in 1970. Uh, you'll hear from Colonel, he's really, he really aerospace engineering, you know. so. Uh, this is very exciting, but he also have a very profound, uh, deep, deep background in nuclear engineering. And he also got a master's degree in nuclear engineering from the University of New Mexico in 1977 and a completed uh, PhD coursework in nuclear engineering also from University of New Mexico in 1980s. 
He holds a graduate certificate in system safety, system safety management, systems engineering, and program management from various institutions. He also received numerous awards from White House, Air Force, United States Air Force, DOE, NASA, Sandia National Laboratories, and the JPL. It's a biography in several Who is Who publications, including Who is Who in America. He is associate fellow of AIWA and a member of the AIWA Aerospace Power System Technical Community and the Albuquerque section of AIWA. Uh, for more information and his resume, and also the 120 plus publication, please visit the website, which is also posted on the uh, event website. So uh, without further ado, let's welcome uh, uh, Colonel uh, Shortis. Uh, thank you, Tim. It's kind of late, I think everyone had a chance to do that stuff before him. And I don't want to uh, belabor uh, the presentation, which has a lot of information. So if you could go back to the slide, I think the analogy, that slide, that slide, please. Yeah. Sound is very muted. Is that any better? Yeah, get closer to the mic. <clears throat> I got it right up against my lips. <laughs> okay. Okay. But the important thing is that a lot of the data, information, figures, photos, and videos uh, that I've incorporated into my presentation. I have taken from NASA and its centers, as well as DOE and its laboratories, as well as online open source uh, sources. So I need to acknowledge and thank uh, those sources. Next slide. The other point I'd like to make is a lot of these slides have a lot of verbiage on them. Uh, Ken is going to make these slides available to anyone who wants to copy them or get and download them in the future. This particular slide is intended to set the stage for the time frame that we're talking about when nuclear energy was being pursued for peaceful purposes, as well as space, uh, both uh, in America as well as uh, the, the Soviet Union. So from 1946, when the Atomic Energy Act was signed, there was a lot of effort primarily on weapons activities, 53. And in December of 53, President Eisenhower announced his atmosphere peace program at a meeting of the UN General Assembly. And, and that resulted in the startup of the first US University research reactor in 1955 at Penn State. Subsequently, in October of 57, Sputnik 1 was launched by the Soviet Union. And we responded in 1958 with launch of Explorer 1. Uh, the first nuclear powered satellite from the US was Transit 4B for the Navy, uh, launched in June of 1961. And we all know that President Kennedy issued his going back to the moon speech at Rice University in 62. And a month later, the Cuban Missile Crisis happened. So there is high ge geopolitical stress in the world. But there was also a lot of effort going into the advancement of peaceful uses of nuclear energy as well as the space race. Next slide. A presentation overview. Again, don't want to focus on the, uh, the minor points, just a historical overview of US and Soviet Russian uh, space nuclear systems to start. Uh, former and current. Uh, U.S. space nuclear systems and the missions that they were involved with. And then the third portion is planned U.S. space nuclear systems and future missions. And we'll try to incorporate some of the beautiful science that was uh, uh, accomplished and received along the way. Next slide. Okay, why nuclear? Well, nuclear is a hazardous technology. So whenever it's used, its need must be compelling. And one of those needs seems to be associated with this duration of operation and its 24 hour 360 uh, day availability and the power density. This kind of just shows you where the generically uh, chemical, which is short duration, but for short, very short durations, very high power density, solar from weeks out to 10 and probably more than that years, 
radioisotopic power systems from anywhere from three to six months out to multiple years. And you'll see that we've gone as long as 40 plus years uh, with those systems. And the reactor is in excess of approximately 10 kilowatts of that. Next slide. Okay. I don't think those systems have enabled fantastic strides in our country's exploration of space. Uh, it involves challenges. Our history begins in 1961 when we launched, and we have launched since that time, 48 nuclear power systems and 300 radioisotopic heating units in support of a variety of missions associated with uh, both NASA, DOD, and civil uh, retirement. One of those missions was Snapshot, uh, launched in April of 1965. It involved a small 500 watt electric reactor power system called SNAP 10A. All the remaining missions were powered by radioisotopic thermal electric generators and or heated by radioisotopic heating units. Next slide. This is an eye test, and it, it basically lists all of the missions and the system types, uh, the nuclear system types that have been used and their current or former status. The ones that are highlighted in orange and yellow involved accidents and malfunctions. Next slide, and we'll talk about those briefly. The first accident was transit 5BN3 for the Navy, a navigational satellite launched in 1964. It failed to achieve orbit and re-entered approximately 100 kilometers uh, over West Indian Ocean near Madagascar, Sri Lanka today. It had a SNAP 9A RPG on board, uh, which provided 25 watts of electrical power and contained 17,000 kilos of plutonium 238. That, that, that amount was equivalent to all the 238 that had been released in weapons testing. Uh, to date, even though 239 was used, 238 also was involved as a backup. Today, uh, as of May 2021, we're talking about 0 0.025 nanocuries of that material remains in the atmosphere, even though 10 kilocuries still are in the biosphere, mostly fixed in the ground. A malfunction happened on the first reactor launch, snap, snapshot with a SNAP 10A reactor on board. It operated for 43 days in orbit, high orbit. And on the 43rd day, uh, a spacecraft voltage regulator malfunction caused the reactor to permanently shut down and irreversibly not be able to restart. That reactor is in a plus 3,000 year orbit today. Nimbus B1, was a meteorological satellite launched in May of 1968 from the Western Test Range. At about 60 seconds into the launch, the range safety officer destroyed the launch vehicle due to its errant descent. It was exceeding limit lines, and all debris fell into the Santa Barbara Channel, including the SNAP-19 RTG, which had 34,000 curies of plutonium-238. There was no release, and the, and the fuel canisters were recovered intact at approximately 100 meters depth. Uh, again, that fuel was used on a later mission. So there are no negative consequences from that event, and no negative consequences from the snapshot malfunction. The Apollo 13, you're all familiar with, but most people do not know that there was a SNAP 27 fuel canister located in the lung, uh, uh, the lunar escape line. That canister survived re-entry when the LEM re-entered uh, with no release, and it currently rests in excess of 7,000 feet of water in the Tonga Trench in the south, southern uh, South Pacific. Next slide. The Soviet or Russian experience has been quite different. They have basically focused on space reactors at low power. Approximately 33 Russian space reactors are launched during the period 1970 to 1997. They powered their radar ocean reconnaissance satellites, which kept watch over uh, naval exercises that we were conducting or NATO uh, exercises 
as well as times of DEF CON increases where the global tension was higher. 31 of those reactors were approximately one to three kilowatt electric uh, thermoelectric uh, systems uh, called BS5 and termed book, uh, which means uh, chamomile for the flower. And photos are shown of, of the book reactor power system and the space gap for the radiation and chemical flower. Two of those 33 were Topaz 1 in core thermionic reactor system at approximately 5 kilowatts of electric, which cost us 1818 and 1867. So the experimental reactor is Newton for that thermionic reactor system, as well as uh, electric propulsion units that were on board for testing. The Russian Topaz 2 was an academic reactor that was never flown. Uh, and only approximately four Russian RTGs, both polonium 210 uh, fueled and plutonium 238 fueled, were launched for lunar and solar system exploration. Three of those failed. Next slide, please. These are the failures and accidents associated with the Soviet and Russian experiments. In, July, in January of 1969, it's believed that a Rosat launch that was uh, powered by a reactor either failed at or on the pad. We know, do not know anything more about that in terms of what the consequences were. Both Cosmos 300 and 305 were polonium 210 fueled systems in RTGs, radioisotope and electric generator. In September of 69, and then later in October of 69, both failed and burned up uh, on the entry into the atmosphere. A Cosmos Rosat launched in April of 73 is also believed to have failed to achieve orbit and fell into the Pacific Ocean north of Japan. Cosmos 954 was probably the worst accident you can imagine. And if it had come down over a populated area, uh, I think that the Soviets would never have flown the reactors again. It was launched in September of 77. It successfully separated from the spacecraft following its end of operation. It did not boost to a higher long life orbit. The reactor re-entered as a result. Uh, over the Pacific Ocean and crashed near Great Slave Lake in northern Canada in January of 1978. 65 kilograms of debris, radioactive objects, and fuel were recovered as part of Project Morning Light uh, that was mounted uh, to assess and recover from that event. Cosmos 1302, the Soviets made a slight uh, improvement on this system to separate the reactor uh, from the spacecraft so that it would burn up more readily uh, on the entry. However, it did not fully burn up uh, in September of 83, and low levels of fusion products were detected in the atmosphere as a result of that re entry. Cosmos 1900, they again reported that they had uh, uh, improved things. Uh, this particular system could not be boosted, but they had an automatic uh, boost uh, system on board, uh, which boosted it successfully to a higher orbit uh, in April of 1988. And most recently, the Mars 96 mission, which had a Plutonium 238 field RPG, we entered on November of 96 and fell near the coast of Chile, Bolivia. That RTG was designed to survive re-entry and no radioactivity was detected from that re-entry or impact. Next slide. Okay. While space nuclear systems have contributed greatly to our knowledge and understanding, because they are nuclear systems, they offer unique safety challenges. These safety challenges must be recognized and addressed in the design, deployment, use, and potential use of each space nuclear system. In doing so, the system's plan and potential uses must be considered, as well as normal, off-normal, and credible accident situations must be taken into account. 
Extensive safety analyses, buttress by safety testing are conducted to determine the level of adequacy of safety built into the system for its intended use. And safety analysis also, also must establish the adequacy for ground testing prior to launch and to assess the risk for each nuclear powered space mission so that an informed decision can be made at the highest levels of our government based on a risk benefit uh, considerations. Next slide. Okay, those mandated for internal and external protocols and processes are just highlighted here. There are UN principles associated with notification, liability, and design and operational guidelines. None of them are mandatory. The US National Environmental Policy Act is mandatory and requires that federal register issues must be, federal register notices must be issued prior to doing anything which is non-recoverable or cannot be uh, before basically bending metal. An environmental assessment or environmental impact statement with public involvement is required and ultimately a record of decisions required for action to proceed, including launch to occur. Internally, we have a space safety review and launch approval process that has worked since the mid sixties up through the Mars 2020 mission. It now has been changed in August of 2019 under National Security Presidential Memorandum Number 20. It now it used to be an interagency nuclear safety review panel made up of DOD, DOE, NASA, EPA, and NRC. It is now a standing board called the Interagency Nuclear Safety Review Board, and it provides oversight of safety and launch approval activities. A safety analysis report is prepared by the mission sponsoring agency. It characterizes and quantifies the risk associated with that mission. The INSRUP or INSRUP reviews that and conducts independent analyses and evaluations on an as needed basis and prepares a safety evaluation report for both the mission sponsoring agency, stakeholder agencies, and ultimately the launch decision maker. Ultimately, an informed launch decision based on boost benefit considerations is made based on inputs from the SAR and the SER. Uh, next slide. Okay, the safety issues and strategies that are used for the different types of space nuclear systems are kind of characterized here. Uh, the primary issue associated with space radioisotopic systems is the containment of radioactive isotopes uh, and fuel to release from to the biosphere. You obviously want to minimize them if possible to exclude that from happening. We also have to be concerned about the potential loss of physical security and positive control over the system and its special nuclear materials. For higher power systems that we have not reached yet, which might in the future, and you'll see uh, shortly uh, with dynamic power conversion systems and higher power radioisotopic systems, they may require active cooling, uh, which could engage a different scenario for overpower or under cooling scenarios during operation. So the safety strategies associated with radioisotopic systems is to design and build a system to be very robust with multiple containment barriers that are rugged to prevent and hopefully preclude under normal, off normal, and credible accident situations the release of the material to the biosphere. <clears throat> also, to take appropriate measures and incorporate special features into the design to prevent sabotage and terrorism against, as well as theft, loft, and diversion of the system and its special nuclear material prior to achieving the plan or the trajectory of space. Space reactors, on the other hand, both for power and propulsion, involve a more complex set of issues. First of all, they're not very radioactive, and typically fresh fuel is utilized. And so there are no fission products at launch to speak of. Zero power testing might be conducted, but again, it's basically at extremely low levels 
just to calibrate the system and its control devices more than anything else. <clears throat> Excuse me. But the potential of that fuel could be released in an accident. And it involves land contamination, but can only pose a, an issue to humans if it can be transported and either ingested or inhaled uh, by the public. Because it is not very radioactive, that is, uranium-235 has a half-life of hundreds of millions of years. And some people will say that, well, that means it's very radioactive. That's not correct. And it is commonly true. Uh, full half-life materials are much more radioactive than long half-life materials on a mass-to-mass -mass basis. And I'll give you a Basically, an analogy for that. Beryllium 9 is, a, is an isotope and a material which is stable. It has an infinite half life. Okay, and it poses no radioactive problems whatsoever. So, the, the contention by the public and others who are unknowledgeable that long half life materials are highly radioactive just don't know what they're talking about. Beyond the release of materials, the potential for inadvertent criticality as a result of a pre-launch launch ascent or re-entry accident prior to achieving the planned setup orbit or trajectory in space does exist. And that needs to be addressed in design as well as with operational restriction. The operational restriction is basically this system shall not be turned on and operated until it's in a nuclear safe orbit or trajectory. In fact, that operational requirement will exist for the entire life of the system, including should a system return to the vicinity of Earth. It cannot go under a nuclear safe orbit or trajectory at any time in its life. The worst thing that can happen already happened for Cosmos 954, the potential re-entry of a radioactively hot reactor after it has been operated in space. That, that potential accident must be avoided and precluded if possible at all costs. Uh, and utilizing a nuclear safe orbiter trajectory is one way to help ensure that. Potential release of fission and activation products generated during reactor operation in space is also an issue as a result of overpower or undercooling events that could occur during operation. Again, with, with a restriction of only operating in a nuclear safe orbital trajectory, that limits the potential for any fission products or debris re-entering the Earth's biosphere. And last, the potential loss and or diversion of uh, special nuclear material to maintain control and cognizance over it until it's in its intended launch or trajectory is important. And there are special, special actions incorporated and integrated into the design help to ensure that. Next slide. To help ensure the safety, uh, multiple analyses are performed and they are buttressed by pressure. Basically the bottom line is that Analyses are relied upon as long as they are benchmarked. So benchmarked analysis must be relied upon to project the responses of the system to a variety of accident environments that can occur. And they can happen individually as well as collectively. If we have an explosion, let's say near the pad, you would have explosion overpressure and impulse imposed upon the spacecraft and the system. That can generate both shrapnel as well as large fragments that can potentially impact the nuclear system. The nuclear system and the spacecraft can then impact the ground. And so a ground impact can occur and debris can fall on top of it. And lastly, both liquid and solid propellant fires can exist close by if there is that possibility close in. Certainly if you're over water or those solids and liquids have been expended, 
those kind of accident environments are less likely and cannot be imposed. But they're nevertheless considered for early launch accidents. And these safety analyses are utilized for ground thrust authorization, in support of NEPA compliance, and for launch approval. Next slide. Okay, the US space nuclear systems that have been developed and used since 1961 are shown on this slide. The first was SNAP-3. It was a radioisotope thermal electric generator that uh, produced 2.7 watts of electrical power. Hmm. It contained 30 curies of plutonium-238 oxide. It was used on transit 4A and 4B missions for the Navy. SNAP-9 was a 25 watt electric RTG Flown in 19, first flown in 1963 and supported the Navy Transit 5B and 1, 2, and 3. Transit 5B and 3 was the system that failed to achieve orbit and burned up on reentry. As a result of that, the policy of having burn up at high altitude was changed to survival till impact at the Earth's surface. The transit RTG, also for the Navy transit system, a 30 watt electric system, was survivable to the, uh, to the Earth's surface, but it was successfully launched in 1972. The SNAP 19 RTG at 40, 40 watts electric, uh, first launched in 1968, supported NOAA's Nimbus B1 and B3, Pioneer 10 and 11 for NASA. Viking 1 and 2 uh, for NASA. The SNAP-27 RTG blew 70 watts electric, was first used in 1969 for Apollos 12 through 17. <clears throat> Subsequently, the multi-100 watt RTG that produced, each one produced 150 watts electric, was first used in 1976 in support of the Lincoln experiment, experimental satellites eight and nine for the Air Force. These were communication satellites uh, for the Air Force to advance communication technology. And also for the Voyager 1 and 2 missions that are now outside uh, our solar system. In 1989, the first use of the General Purpose Heat Source RTG, which produces 275 watts electric, was employed for Galileo, Ulysses, Cassini, and New Horizons, and we'll be talking more about that. The multi-mission RTG, which is a plant RTG utilized in, in the inventory, produces 110 watts of electric. It is a system designed for planetary surfaces, so it is buttoned up. All the other prior ones were in vacuum systems. It was first utilized in 2011, 2011 on the Mars Science Laboratory mission, and the Mars 2020 mission most recently, which landed in February of, of 2020, 2021 on the Mars surface. And we're talking about those now. The radioisotopic heater units, the lightweight radioisotopic heater unit has been used 300 times in support of Galileo, Ulysses, Mars Pathfinder, C, and Mars Exploration Rover A and B missions, which by the way were Primary power was solar, not nuclear. They each produced one, one watt thermal. Three of uh, excuse me, eight of those each were used on more A and more B. <coughs> excuse me. Uh, I take that back. Three were used on Mars Pathfinder, and eight were used on Mars A and B. And on Apollo 11, most people don't know that. You see there that a radioisotopic heating unit. 15 watt thermal was utilized for the early Apollo science experimental package for Apollo 11 in 1969. And we've talked about the SNAP thermal first launched in 1965, 500 watts electric, 43 watts thermal for the snapshot mission in support of Air Force demonstration of reactor technology and electric propulsion technology. Next slide. Okay, these are just pretty pictures showing you. Here is a photo of a SNAP-3. The SNAP-3 on uh, President Eisenhower's desk. A SNAP-3 integrated to the first transit 
uh, mission for the Navy. And both the SNAP-9 and the SNAP-3 RPG shown with Lynn Seaboard and yeah. Major Bob Carpenter, who was my predecessor at DOE several times for me. And a cutaway of the SNAP-3 RPG and a uh, picture depicting a uh, somewhat cutaway of the SNAP-9 RPG. Next slide. Tiny. The snapshot mission, which used the SNAP-10A uh, 500 watt electric system. This is a reactor shown here in the left corner of this uh, scenario. It uh, uh, used high enriched uranium and the uranium fuel was uranium zirconium hydride with uh, a NAC-78, uh, a sodium potassium 78, which is a eutectic of sodium and potassium so that it would not freeze in space. It was utilized as the coolant, the thermal electric uh, pump, and the thermal electrics, which were silicon germanium mounted on the uh, inward side of a uh, shadow shield shaped conical radiator uh, at the aft end of the uh, reactor and power system itself. Uh, the radiator itself rejected the vast majority of the heat. 95% of the heat was rejected to space. Okay, next slide. Nimbus B1 and 3 use the SNAP-19 RPG. Picture of cutaway and a picture of the spacecraft we utilized two SNAP-19 RPG. Next slide. Apollo 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 use 70 watt electric SNAP 27 RTGs, where the canister was inside the limb and the generator was separate. This shows Alan Bean extracting the fuel canister and inserting it into the generator for the SNAP. I think this was SNAP 13, excuse me. The first time that uh, the photo was actually taken. Here's the generator with the fuel capsule inserted. It powered the Apollo Lunar Surface Experiment Package. Uh, and each one of these, there are what, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, five Apollo Lunar Service Experiment Packages on the surface of the moon at a variety of locations, powered by five SNAP-27 RPGs. The Apollo 13, as you know, did not make it to the lunar surface. It returned to Earth because of an explosion on the service module. And it returned and the limb re-entered with the fuel canister and survived re-entry and is at the bottom of the Tonga Trench. Next slide. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Apollo 11 used uh, two 15-watt thermal uh, heat sources for its uh, early Apollo science experiment package. Pioneer 10 and 11, the first RAM tools, both had four 40 watt electric SNAP-19 RTGs on board. You can see the four RTGs swung along the side and the spacecraft with, with its uh, high gain antenna shown on the left and on the right. Next slide. These systems are still operational and they're outside uh, the solar system, but they're only uh, intermittent checks just to ensure that they still are operational. But the signal is so very weak, it's, it's, it's hard to uh, focus on. Next, uh, the Viking 1 and 2 missions, which use two 40-watt SNAP-19 RTGs on each mission. There's a Viking 1 and a Viking 2 on two different locations. They're located under these domes that you see on the spacecraft. And here's a photo, an actual photo, first photo provided back of the Martian surface from Viking 2, which uh, we actually arrived at the surface of Mars before Viking 1. Next slide. The Lincoln Experimental Satellites 8 and 9, two separate uh, satellites launched separately. Uh, they each had two 
150 watt electric multi 100 watt RTGs on board. So a total of 300 watts electric for each spacecraft. This was an advanced communication satellite system and a demonstration of their technology, but they remained operational. In fact, LESS-9 was just shut down in 2019. LESS-8 uh, had a communication issue and was shut down early. Next slide. Voyager 1 and 2, which were truly the best grand uh, missions of all, each had three 150 watt, multi 100 watt RTGs using silicon germanium as the thermoelectric material. Uh, the systems were located out on a boom, uh, as you can see here, and they did a grand tour of Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, did not get to Pluto, and then headed out into uh, the Kuiper Belt exited the Kuiper Belt and ultimately hit the, uh, uh, the heliosphere and exited the heliosphere uh, several years ago. So now they are now in interstellar space. So then they've operated for in, in excess of, so they launched in 1977 and they've been operational since that time. So that's 44 years uh, of total operation. Next slide. Because these systems are utilized thermoelectrics, there are no moving parts. It's basically just a, a thermocouple, many thermocouples that see a hot temperature from the heat source. And then a cold temperature is maintained by the radiator temperature and the radiation to space. And that difference in temperature establishes a voltage differential and if you put a load on it, you get current flowing through that load. Galileo was the first use and the first launch on the space shuttle. It used two 270 watt electric general purpose heat source RTGs and 120 lightweight radioisotopic heater units each on uh, the Galileo mission. Here's a picture of the GPHS RTG cut away, a scaled up version of the a lightweight radioisotopic heater unit, and some of the photos taken from this mission, which was intended to study the, the Jupiter system, and in particular, the moons of Jupiter, the Galilean moons of Jupiter, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Next slide. The Ulysses mission, which was a joint mission between NASA and the European Space Agency was also launched on the shuttle uh, and it utilized one 275 watt electric general purpose resource RTG. The system was launched and went out via an inertial upper stage booster to Jupiter where it had a phase change out of the plane in the ecliptic so that it could fly over the poles of the sun and the uh, closest it comes to the sun is 3 AU. So it's outside the orbit of the Earth. That system operated for approximately nine years before it, the spacecraft ran out of propellant. Next slide. Mars, Mars Pathfinder used three one watt lightweight radioisotopic heater units. They're located in the warm electronic box. It is underneath the solar panel for the Sojourner rover. The Sojourner rover is extremely small and it was a pathfinder for rover technology. This is a picture of the Mars Pathfinder lander and the actual Sojourner rover next to a boulder that's about the same size as, as itself. The cutaway uh, actually a disassembly view of the lightweight radioisotopic heater unit. The fueled clad itself is about the size of a pencil eraser. It uses platinum 30 rhodium as a fuel clad. It's then inserted within a, a what's called a GIZ, graphite impact shell, and that in inside the aeroshell itself. 
So there are three separate containment barriers to release of the plutonium-238 oxide, oxide that's inside that third cloud. If you can, uh, I don't know if you can blow up the picture in the lower left here, Ken, but it shows the locations of Viking 1, Viking 2, and Mars Pathfinder relative uh, to one another on the Mars surface. And this is a picture from Mars Pathfinder, the first picture looking back at the sun from Mars Pathfinder. Okay, next slide. That one watt rue in there, by the way, extended the mission life because it kept the battery and the warm electronics warm uh, during uh, the, the Martian nights and the beginning of the Martian winter. The system was designed to last 30 days. It actually went, uh, lasted in excess of 120 days, I believe. The Cassini mission is the mission that has used the most amount of plutonium-238 oxide of any mission flown to date. It incorporated and used three general purpose heat source RTGs, each supplying 275 watts of electric energy, so a total of almost 900 watts of electric power to the spacecraft, as well as 117 heat sources on board to keep the electronics uh, warm in various locations on the spacecraft. Uh, a total of 33 kilograms of plutonium-238 oxide was launched uh, to support the Cassini launch. And that involves, let's see, was, uh, in excess of 10 curies per, per watt. So that's 330 curies, 330,000 curies of plutonium-238 oxide. Picture of the, uh, the spacecraft. There was also a European Huygens uh, lander that entered and descended to the surface of Titan uh, during the course of this mission. And we'll talk about Cassini more because I consider it still a, an extended mission, even though it was shut down in 2017 or 2018. Next slide. The Mars Exploration Rovers, A and B, Spirit and Opportunity, were intended to last at most one year. They were solar panel, solar powers system as the primary power, and eight one watt roos were inserted in the one electronic box to keep the battery and the electronics warm for these rovers. And they both, as a result of that, lasted in excess of seven years uh, on the surface. They did the first, if you will, really useful study and exploration of the surface of Mars. And here's a picture from the rover, one of the rovers looking back at its own tracks on the surface of Mars. Next slide. The New Horizons Pluto mission involved a partially uh, loaded GPHS RTG. Uh, it was it's shown on the spacecraft here. Uh, it was not possible to fully load the GPHS RTG and produce 275 watts of electrical energy. It actually turned out to be 200, 200 watts electric on board. And it was launched on Atlas V in 2006, as I recall, and arrived at Pluto in 2015, nine years later. It's a long distance to get out there to Pluto. And this is the view that we saw prior to the, the best resolution we had of Pluto prior to what we're going to show you later for the Pluto New Horizons mission. Next slide. Okay. Also, in addition to those systems, there were many programs to try to advance space reactors for utilization in support of a variety of missions. Unfortunately, none of them were actually flown. But the, the SNAP systems, SNAP stands for Systems for Nuclear Auxiliary Power. And the odd number SNAP systems are RTGs, radioisotopic thermoelectric generators, 
and the even powered systems, as you see here, or reactor systems, which involve the 10A, the 2, <coughs> the 8, and the SNAP spur 50 systems. They were intended to provide greater power than the SNAP 10A system, which was thrown at 500 watts electric, but they were never pursued. The systems and the programs were terminated in 1972, uh, long in conjunction with basically the uh, termination of the Apollo program without follow on at the moon or onward to Mars. Next slide. Also, in addition to that, uh, this shows uh, photos of the SNAP 10A and two systems, which were very similar. The SNAP 8 at uh, a higher power level, the SNAP 10A power system overall, and the SNAP 8 system and its shield, uh, shadow shield. Next slide. U.S. space reactors programs that also were pursued in the early 60s are shown here. These are the SNAP systems, if you will. Then in 1983-84 time period, there was a, uh, a need identified by both NASA as well as the Department of Defense to develop a 100 kilowatt electric class space reactor, which was called ultimately the SNAP-100. Uh, SP-100 system, excuse me. There were others that were pursued in, in kind of concert with that, Star C, a thermionic program of 40 kilowatts electric and a low power SP-100 at like 10 to 40 uh, kilowatts electric. In addition, I don't have a, an equivalent slide, but in the 2003 time period, a program called Prometheus was started by NASA uh, to advance reactor technology for nuclear electric propulsion of a platform that would go to the Jupiter uh, system, and it was called JIMO, Jupiter Icy Moon Orbiter. That system only lasted, or that program only lasted two years uh, until it was terminated. The reasons for termination were basically it required a super heavy launch vehicle and the advancement of technologies associated with power conversion technologies and the electric propulsion technologies were simply not as could not scale up sufficiently to support a 200 kilowatt electric platform. Next slide. Okay, a little focus on SP100 because it was kind of the basis for the Prometheus program, although divergence was used, they considered a liquid metal cooled reactor that produced approximately five uh, megawatts thermal of energy to produce 100 to 300 watts of electrical power, depending upon what power conversion system you utilize. Either thermoelectrics at 100, kilowatt, 100 kilowatts electric or the potential for transitioning the 300 watts electric using uh, dynamic energy conversion technologies, most likely breaking rotating units at that time. Uh, the reactor is shown at the top, the shield, shadow shield below it. These are shown as the thermoelectric power conversion systems. We use silicon germanium, but conductively coupled uh, silicon germanium to a panel and a coolant which fed the, re the radiator, which had to unfold at 300 kilowatts electric, but was a constant fixed radiator at 100 kilowatts electric. Okay, this program was basically terminated in, I believe, 1989. And its demise kind of just followed the demise and the implosion of the Soviet Union more than anything else. Next slide. In addition, during the late 50s through the 60s and into the early 70s, a program called Rover Nerva. Rover was the Air Force program and Nerva was the NASA program. Nerva standing for Nuclear Energy and Rocket Vehicle Application. Uh, 
there were 23 different injuries that were tested at Nevada, at the Nevada test site, the Jackass test. And they showed the feasibility of actual nuclear thermal propulsion. The way these operate is quite simple, actually, except the operational concepts are extremely harsh. You're basically pushing liquid hydrogen through an operating reactor. And if we're talking about a reactor that needs to produce 25,000 pounds of thrust, which was associated with the PV-1 nerve test, and what's currently being considered for a NASA return to Mars, they could be 25,000 pound thrust engine, perhaps as many as three of them on a platform. But at the engine level, you're pushing liquid hydrogen through that hot reactor, cooling the nozzle, cooling the control element, controlling any, any moderators first, and then going through the hot core, picking up heat, converting to gaseous hydrogen, which then expands through a nozzle, out a nozzle to produce thrust. Next slide. That program involved many open air tests, which can't be conducted today because of the National Environmental Policy Act. But nevertheless, they were conducted in the period of 63 through 72 at the uh, Jackass Flats at the Nevada test site. Here you're seeing one in the center top slide, an open air with orientation upward, thrust upward. At the left bottom is a system which would thrust downward into a chamber uh, that had been evacuated with argon and one it's more typical downward with a flame change. This is an overall system shown with a model uh, showing an alternate nerve system with turbo pumps, light turbo pumps, and fuel, at least some of the fuel tanks. Uh, but none of these ever made it to flight, and a flight system was never built. Next slide. Okay, the current and what I call relatively recent U.S. space nuclear systems and the missions follow now. Next slide. We'll start with the systems. The current systems are the one watt uh, lightweight radioactive topic heater unit. Okay, you can see that it, it contains 2.7 grams of 238 oxide associated with that's, that's equal to 30, 30 kilograms for 30 kilos of plutonium-238, and we'll show you the size here later. The general purpose heat source, which is shown below, is utilized in these relatively recent ones up through Ulysses and Pluto New Horizons. Excuse me. Uh, it involves a stack of 16 general purpose heat source modules, which are shown in the upper right. Here, there are two fueled clads that are clad with uh, a, an iridium alloy inserted in time in type inside a graphite impact shell. And that graphite impact shell has been inserted inside an oil shell for each of the modules. The module dimensions are approximately two inches by two inches, excuse me, four inches by four inches by two inches high. And they are stacked. They're intended to survive the entry uh, intact and also a resilient impact and other uh, environmental accident conditions that might exist. On the bottom is shown the 110 watt multi mission radioisotope thermal electric generator, uh, and it involves a stack of eight general purpose heat source modules that have been upgraded somewhat to include greater thickness of the uh, 3D compact composite graphite aeroshell and also uh, to make it a block structure rather than a box structure, structure which was used for the general purpose features of TG. Next slide. Here's a photo of the one watt glue 
It's about the size of a C uh, battery, C size battery, C cell battery uh, for the outer air shell. Again, the uh, field clad is about the size of a pencil eraser. And to give you kind of a sense of scale, there's a dime shown there. Uh, the field clad contains 2.7 grams plutonium-238 oxide inserted inside the insulation shells and the biz, which is then inside the air shell itself with caps uh, made of the same 3D fine weakness that is air shell material. Next slide. Okay, the general purpose heat source RTG here is one at the Cape, shown being mocked if you will, monitor for any radiation leakage. Uh, it's an al it contains plutonium-238, which is primarily an alpha emitter, but it also produces uh, spontaneous fission. So a neutron, a high energy neutron fluence can exceed. And it, at about this distance where this uh, uh, red health officer is looking at, it's approximately 10 to 30 milligram per hour at that distance. There's one on a uh, transport stand, again in the facility at the, at the Cape. Here is a hot fueled clad inside of a just a sand uh, pit that's been created to show you how hot they can get, and a picture of a fueled clad, which is uh, uh, an iridium alloy that's welded at the uh, at the hemisphere in the center. So two cups of this iridium clad contain a pellet of plutonium 238 oxide, which is inserted in the gizzes, two of them into the gizzes, two gizzes into the module and, and 16 modules into the RTG itself. On the exterior surface is where the generator is where the thermoelectrics are located. Next slide. The current US RTG we've talked about, it involves a stack of upgraded called step two GPHS modules uh, linearly inside uh, to produce 110 watts of electrical power using a different uh, uh, thermoelectric material, lead telluride tags. And that was required because of the short duration uh, scheduled to produce this flight hardware. NASA came to DOE and said, we need a buttoned up system for the surface of Mars by this date certain. And so they went to technologies that they knew would, would work. And they went back basically to uh, technologies that were utilized for Viking, which are lead telluride tags. And but did incorporate the improved updated GPHS modules as a heat source. Here's a picture, there's the heat source located on the rear aft portion of the Mars Science Laboratory Curiosity rover. And it's taking a black and white picture after it arrived on the surface of Mars. First picture from Mars taken by Curiosity after landing on Mars. Next slide. Okay, current and relatively recent space missions that these systems were flown in. Next slide. We talked about Cassini. Cassini was a spectacular mission. It was launched and operated for 20 years. Uh, six, seven of those years was in terms of two seven. Next slide. It was launched on a Titan, excuse me, a Titan 4B with a Centaur upper stage, and it was a night launch uh, in 1997 from Cape Canaveral. Quite spectacular. Next slide. It used, uh, uh, excuse me, a, a Centaur upper stage after the payload fairing was uh, uh, removed. Uh, it fired and went on its way, but it had a circuitous path to Jupiter. Excuse me, Saturn. Next slide. It had what was called a Venus, Venus, Earth, Jupiter gravity assist trajectory. It was launched here, it went around Jupiter, 
Had a swing ball of Jupiter to gain a little bit of uh, Delta V. A second swing ball of, of Venus to gain additional Delta V. And subsequently, close by by of Earth to gain its final Delta V before it went on its way flying past Jupiter for a final Delta V flyby and arrival at Saturn in July of 2024. A total of, let's see, that makes it seven years, I believe. Yeah. Uh, from launch to arrival at Saturn. Next slide. At the same time, the spacecraft released the Huygens probe, which descended by parachute into the atmosphere of Titan, the largest moon of Saturn. And the spacecraft remained in orbit around Saturn, flying through the rings and visiting by virtue of a variety of elliptical uh, trajectories and bypasses, flybys of each of the major moons and each of the rings of Saturn. Next slide. Oh, here we can actually show this video. This is a video that focuses on the end portion of the Cassini mission when it actually is deorbited into the atmosphere of Saturn. But it gives a short summary of those activities prior to that. Slowly, people started to gather around these images, which no one had seen. Close-up images flying right over the tops of the rings. And they were just uh, goosebumps. I've, it's a memory I will never forget. You can see we saw a rotating portion of at the North Pole of Saturn. There's also a rotating portion at the South Pole of Saturn. In the atmosphere. This is a photo of Enceladus and the geysers associated the with Enceladus. Of where we might look for life. There could be a world around a giant planet and have conditions that are right for life. Enceladus is believed to be an ocean world with approximately a two kilometer thick ice sheet and a liquid ocean beneath. In addition, these guys will spew out material from that liquid ocean. It's just a monumental machine. It's the individual people that all put their pride in putting, in putting this together and building it right. This is a view of Titan. On the Cassini spacecraft, we're going to see in a moment some photos of Titan then, during the descent of the Huygens probe to the surface Saturn, of Titan. Measuring the composition of Saturn's atmosphere, sending back signs till the very last second, we'll continue to learn from Cassini long after the end of the mission. Okay, Ken, next slide. Okay, this just shows some of the moons that you can see of Saturn. I, I don't know the actual number. They seem to uh, discover a new one every time you turn around. They have to actually exist within the rings of Saturn. But this is a view, to a known view, of Titan to the Saturn and Titan. And if you at the right, you can see the auroras at the South Pole in the atmosphere of Saturn. And in this location right here, you see lightning, which exists within the atmosphere of, uh, of Saturn. A view looking back at the sun from the Cassini spacecraft, uh, it was kind of an interesting view. Uh, the North Pole of Saturn, and unfortunately that macro is not showing it rotating, and at the Southern Pole of Saturn. Next slide. 
Oh, there you see some notation. A view of Saturn prior to uh, Cassini arriving at the Saturnian system, and a view of uh, Titan uh, from the Cassini spacecraft and from the Huygens probe as it descended. And you'll see there are actually organic hydrocarbon lakes on the surface of Titan. Titan is an interesting body because it exists at the uh, triple point, near the triple point of methane. And so the various hydrocarbons of methane can exist in solid, liquid, and gaseous forms on the surface of Titan. Next slide. And a view of Enceladus, which is believed to be an ocean world. And uh, I'm almost certain that there will be a future mission after Europa going to Enceladus uh, to sample material that's being rejected from those geysers, as well as ultimately drilling and melting through the ice sheets to explore the liquid ocean beneath that ice sheet of Enceladus. Next slide. The Mars Exploration Rovers A and B, which shows the launch uh, on June 3rd and July 3rd, uh, June, June of 03 and July of 03. One a day launch and one night launch on a Delta II launch vehicle. Next slide. And its crew stage on its way to, uh, excuse me, to and it entered using a, a supersonic. Uh, well, first of all, they had to survive the high ablation and temperatures through the high atmosphere and high velocity uh, environment. When it passed through that, then a high, high velocity supersonic parachute was uh, ejected and slowed it down further. Finally, retro rockets were fired and a conglomeration of balls that contain the spacecraft inside arrived and bounced to its final location. And that system opened up with deflation of the, uh, the balls. Uh, the kettles opened and the spacecraft drove off uh, onto the surface of Mars and the location of each of the spirit and opportunity uh, rovers Rel relative to Viking 1 and 2 and the Mars uh, Sojourn, the Pathfinder Sojourn uh, rover. Next slide. Oh, this animation is probably worth watching. Let's show you. NASA's plans to send two rovers to Mars got underway in the year 2000. Their mission, to spend three months exploring the red planet's surface. The mission's principal investigator, Professor Steve Squires, has dedicated 16 years of his life to making this ambitious mission a reality. I had absolutely no idea how rough it was actually going to be. If you could forward this, Ken, uh, a little bit. A lot wrong, but it missed. And burned up in the atmosphere. The cause, a mix-up between English and metric units. Then, just 10 weeks later, they lost its sister probe. Our mission arose from catastrophe. We had two missions that preceded us, uh, Polar Lander and Climate Orbiter, that were both lost at Mars. Squire's project is mission almost impossible. He has just under three years to build and launch two new rovers. Either we were going to go to Mars when we did, or we probably were never going to go at all. And so we had this absolutely inflexible deadline. The schedule is seriously tough, but the real challenges are technical. The probes must survive a bone-shaking launch, a seven-month flight, and then hit a re-entry window just four miles across traveling at 12,000 miles per hour. 
In the atmosphere, a complex parachute system will decelerate the probes to just 12 miles per hour. They will literally bounce to a standstill using a series of airbags. Only once the protective casing opens can their mission begin. Again, this next slide, please. And it, the system itself was primarily powered by solar panels that are pretty obvious on these rovers and utilized uh, uh, small amounts of heaters, eight heater units inside the one electronic. Six, five, four, three, two. Okay, let's so Okay. You can see the solar panels and the, the uh, uh, Lightweight radar oscillotropic heater units are inside the red box, red electronic box, underneath the solar panels. Keep the battery and the electronics low. Next slide. Next slide, Kim. Okay, some views from Spirit, I believe. You can see motion of the clouds, and the atmosphere is predominantly CO2. Dust devils are on the surface, swirling around, which are both good and bad. They can help to clean up uh, your solar panels, or they can deposit dust on top of you at the same time. Next slide. And some locations. Uh, one at, uh, let's see, Opportunity was at Victoria Crater. And, uh, if we get uh, Gale Crater was the other crater utilized for spirit. Next slide. And then significant uh, both fire, liquid erosion as well as uh, atmospheric erosion, wind erosion of the surfaces and topography. Next mission is uh, the New Horizons Pluto mission with a 200. Lot of left of GPHS ITG, between the left front. Spacecraft was not very massive. It's on the order of 500 kilograms total. It was launched on the five. It was a very capable upper stage and went direct. Uh, passing Jupiter for a flight, a delta V increase, and it ran with Pluto. That's all. Uh, That's all. Uh, this just shows, if you will, kind of the history of the system. It was a flyby of Pluto. It was not an orbiter. And we knew of Nix Hydra, but we discovered two additional uh, moons of Pluto uh, during the course of the mission. Next, and this is the animation of this mission. I hope the connection is better than the last one. Transit time again was nine years from Earth to Pluto. We're passing Mars, Jupiter, in somewhat close proximity, but not really. And then onward into void of space for Pluto. It was the fastest man made object in space. Uh, and can you advance this out for the end? And finally arriving at the Pluto system with its closest approach in July 2015. Basically, no more than 24 hours of time uh, at the target of interest. Next slide. Okay, this shows you basically 
from, I forget the date, 2001. That's the best resolution photo of Pluto prior to the Pluto New Horizons encounter with Pluto and what we actually uh, saw in 2015. Pretty amazing. Next slide. And this one is a spectacular collage. This video it was just a flyby of Pluto. Okay, and this is Sharon, I believe, and shown in the distance. But what you're going to see in this video was something that Johns Hopkins, with assistance from JPO, pulled together a collage of photos during the 23 to 24 hour encounter of Pluto so that it appears like it's a uh, fly over of the surface, almost an orbit of that, of, of the Pluto itself. And those photos had to be scaled, obviously, to make it look like a fly. They were pretty amazing graphics that were created by John Hopkins. This is a nice world also. It's mostly nitrogen ice. So it's possible that uh, we may visit it again. I know that uh, there are scientists who want to plan a mission for an orbiter. And beyond that, in, in the far future, a lander on the surface of Pluto itself. Okay, Ken, let's move on to the next slide. And a continuation of the Pluto New Horizons mission when it entered the Kuiper Belt. It's a region of asteroids and prim primitive materials from the, basically the origin of our solar system that exist in a, a ring around the sun. And uh, in January, I think it was January 1st of 2019, the Pluto New Horizons spacecraft encountered Ultima Thule, a primitive object in the Kuiper Belt. And there's a photo of it shown in the room. Next slide. And there are plans for another encounter in the Kuiper Belt uh, for uh, that spacecraft in the future. Okay. The Mars Science Laboratory, most of you are probably pretty uh, familiar with what I've shown already. It uses a different landing technique called the Skyplane. It was too large and too heavy to actually utilize bouncing airbags. It had to use a Skyplane, which had retro rocks at its on it, after using a parachute, parachute and a uh, air shell through the atmosphere. Not to slow it down. So let's do this mission in the next few minutes. This is on route, you have to stay separating in the pre stage until it's in time with Rick Mars about six or seven months later. Then the aeroshell, ablating, and the upper aeroshell, separating away with a parachute, slowing it down, then firing retro rockets, slow the whole sky plane system down, then lowering it on cables from that sky plane to the surface. Then cutting the, the cables and the sky plane goes off and crashes on the surface of Mars. That's how it got there. Okay, next slide. Okay. okay, we this slide is here to basically show you some contrast in the upper right, the Sojourner rover, the Mars Exploration Rover. Okay. Spirit and Opportunity, and the MSL and Perseverance rover for scale. And also a scale for the real size sizes involved for the Curiosity and Perseverance module. Now, the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover has different instruments and a different mission 
than the MSL Curiosity Rover. Curiosity Rover is intended for exploration of a crater site. I think it's, uh, and, and the Perseverance Rover is landing at Jezero Crater at the edge. And its main purpose is to identify and cache away samples from Mars, which will subsequently be returned on a subsequent mission to Earth for study. Next slide. A look at Mars Science Laboratory in 2012 when it arrived, and in 2018 after enduring uh, the dust from both dust storms and just, if you will, resuspending dust as it moves and settles on its own surface. Next slide. Future missions that are entailed. Probably one of the areas, and this is from my perspective, some are actually identified and are, will be manifested soon. Next slide. Okay, first the systems, an upgrade of the MMRTG using different thermoelectric materials at slightly higher temperatures, gutterudites basically, rather than the telluride tags, which will provide an increase uh, in output power from 110 to 140 watts at the beginning of life, but a reduced reduction over its life, substantially less than the lead telluride tags. The next gen RTG is actually trying to recover the GPHS RTG. That unfortunately was a loss to the country. The line that existed at the uh, first General Electric and then the Lockheed Martin line at the uh, GE Valley, Valley Forge was shut down after the FD100 program was terminated. Uh, because basically, Silicon Germanium was not identified for any future mission at that time. Now we need an in vacuum system with higher efficiency thermoelectrics and a more robust heat source. So this is recovering the GPHS RTG with upgraded GPHS modules, step two modules, and we'll start with silicon germanium and ultimately will be upgraded, hopefully in the future, to advanced thermoelectrics beyond the silicon germanium at some point in the future. In fact, it might be a segmented uh, modular RTG, which can provide somewhere between 50 and 500 watts electric, depending upon the number of modules. Each module involves two general purpose heat source modules. So stack up to 16, 16 so eight modules together, 16 GPHS modules uh, to produce 500 watts electric. Next slide. Okay, the development of a dynamic radioisotope power system. The requirement is to produce somewhere between 100 and 500 watts electric at a higher efficiency than thermoelectrics can deliver. Could be as high as 25 to 30 percent using Brayton, Sterling, three piston Sterling, or perhaps Rankin energy conversion technology. I believe that the this program is now in phase two, and we're down selected to two technologies that are being pursued. Next slide. A return to the moon. Vision surface power has been identified as a needed uh, requirement for sustenance of human presence on the moon. And at first it appeared to be the kilopower reactor, uh, which has been tested back in 2017 at uh, the Nevada uh, test site. He actually did a test of a low power vision surface power system. There. Next slide. What they need is on the order of 10 kilowatts electric per unit uh, at both uh, the moon and ultimately at Mars. And they may have to be ganged together into four at the surface of Mars. This is the crusty test and the system being shown. It was a nuclear system test, not really a reactor test. I mean, the, the reactor itself, the active core was uranium moly disks. But in order to gain criticality, instead of having the beryllium reflector 
as a separate assembly. They used a critical assembly at the Nevada test site to provide that beryllium moderation and reflection to make the system go critical and provide the thermal heat for the Stirling engines to be utilized. And they used a parasitic load and they also used a, I'll call it parasitic uh, heat removal system to mimic uh, a radiator, a heat removal uh, subsystem. Next slide. Systems that are going to be flown, it appears. This one, the Dragonfly mission, is a mission which is uh, manifested. It's a Gen Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory mission that will fly, be launched in 2027 and arrive to investigate Titan, the surface of Titan, and it is a drone which flies from one point to another on the surface of Titan. Can you hit that video, uh, Kim? NASA is pushing the boundaries of human knowledge and expanding the limits of technology. I am proud to announce that our next New Frontiers mission, Dragonfly, will explore Saturn's largest moon, Titan. Titan has a very thick atmosphere made up of hydrocarbons. So a flight there is much easier than it is on the, in the atmosphere of Mars, which only has 1% of the uh, density of the atmosphere on Earth. Here flight is going to be quite easy. Or even present life. So we have on Titan opportunity to observe the processes um, that were present on early Earth when life began to form and possibly even conditions that may be able to harbor life today. One of the things that is particularly exciting about this mission is that we can do the very detailed chemical measurements but be able to put them in the context of Titan as a system. It's the science that really motivates us to do this exciting and difficult mission. Go Dragonfly. Okay, Cam, let's go back to the point, yeah? Mm -hmm. And in the bottom is, I believe it's a phase A mission intended to fly uh, to 500 AU in 50 years. And it's called the Interstellar Probe Mission. And it will use the best technology we have today to get there. And it will require 300 watts electric in 50 years. When it arrives at that 50 to 500 AU point beyond the Julio Sphere. So this is a Julio centric mission. It is not a planetary uh, study mission. Next slide. New term powered heated space missions. We can talk about the Trident mission, the Triton, which is a large, large mission, a large moon of Neptune. Trident has water, volcanic, and geyser, or volcano. And the material there, it may also be a, an ocean world. We don't know. And you can see on the surface that there's material coming out of the Volcano. So these volcanoes don't make it through all the way to a liquid ocean if it exists below that ice sheet. Next slide. The uh, current Decato identifies two missions Uranus orbital probe and Neptune orbiter, either of which have been manifested as of today. But the current Decato, which will come out, that report will come out next spring may indeed identify one or two of these missions and may go back to uh, pick up the tribe mission as well as any kind of trade mission. We shall see. Next slide. Ocean World Cryobots. Ultimately, there is an interest in getting through by virtue of melting and drilling through the ice sheets of Europa, Enceladus, and other ocean worlds. And developing that it, extremely extremely challenging mission. We're talking about eight kilowatts of thermal energy inside 
uh, the volume associated with perhaps one to two paint cans uh, in order to get through the, uh, the ice sheet in a reasonable amount of time and allow the cryobot to explore the interface of the ocean with the uh, ice sheet and the ocean with the surface of those worlds inside. It has to be very compact and requires a great deal of, of heat. Next slide. And onward to Mars. As you know, there is a, an effort underway to study nuclear-electric propulsion, excuse me, space nuclear propulsion technology. Both nuclear-electric propulsion and nuclear thermal propulsion, perhaps to carry cargo and crew to Mars in the 2030s. I participated in a study over the last year. The report was issued in February, and it's available at my uh, website if you can uh, get to it, which I think is available on Ken's uh, announcement for this mission. Next slide. These missions, that those missions, by the way, require extremely high uh, specific impulse. That is, you need to be very efficient in the utilization of your fuel. But the fuel, because the fuel you have loaded at Earth, when you Start going toward Mars is all the fuel that you will have for getting there and back safely with cargo and crew. This involves uh, four vision surface power systems on the surface of Mars to pr provide a sus sustainable uh, human presence on Mars at some point in the future. Next slide. Beyond that, you know, your imagination is just as good as mine. We could see platforms that visit a variety of, of targets in our solar system or beyond. They may use nuclear electric propulsion. They may use nuclear thermal propulsion. They may use antimatter or fusion propulsion. That's to be determined. Next slide. So all of this basically started with Sputnik 1 in 1957. And here we are in 2021, and we've made great strides, but there's still so much more to see. Next slide. This is a photo looking back at the Earth from the moon during Apollo 11. It shows uh, Earth view, and it's, if you will, a tribute to Michael Collins. He took this photo out and remained in the command module while his two cohorts descended to the surface of the moon for exploration. Next slide. So one can only imagine the possibilities from this point on. And they are exhilarating. And I'd like to live that long to see if much of it happen. So we can close this now and hopefully we have some time for questions. Yes, yes, this is so amazing, you know, uh, all the uh, excitement for the nuclear propulsion and uh, energy and the uh, space exploration. Uh, so, uh, Colonel, there's, there are some questions in the Q&A. Do you like to, uh, and folks, do you want to, if you want to speak out, uh, we'll enable you, please click raise hand. Otherwise, Colonel will uh, go through the Q&A uh, box and uh, uh, we can, he will answer the questions. Okay, let me start with uh, answering the uh, question that was posed on chat first. And it was about how do you do the risk assessment to support launch equipment? Well, during the early days in the, in the mid 60s up through probably until Galileo, so through less eight and nine, uh, Voyager, and uh, until Galileo. Basically, it was sequence diagrams and best estimates based on testing and independent phenomenological analyses. We have since advanced to phenomenological analyses that have been benchmarked for all of these environments, explosion over pressure, impulse, impacts by small and large fragments, impacts with the surface, be it sand or concrete, uh, including steel, you know, 
and uh, liquid and propellant, solid propellant trawlers. Uh, and they are incorporated and called within a, an overarching code called LASIK, the Launch Accident Scenario Evaluation Program. It is a Monte Carlo style code that for each of the different accident categories that have been identified, uh, for example, one happening for the first 30 seconds where there's a potential for impacts on sol solid hard surfaces. Uh, it will call these individual phenomenological codes as needed to determine the response based on the environment that is projected for many, many runs through this Monte Carlo code. We'll do as many as a, as a million individual cases for each of the accident categories so that we have good statistics and can project what the response would be and what the best estimate as well as the uncertainty about that best estimate might be. And it uses, it ultimately produces uh, cumulative uh, distribution functions. Complementary cumulative distribution functions are what are ultimately used to determine the confidence level for each uh, individual consequence. And they are then tied together into a one mission analysis for the decision maker. And we can, we can peel that onion for the decision maker to answer any questions he might have along the way. Okay, I think that puts that question to bed, I hope. Uh, any other questions from the audience? I'm not, <clears throat> did I get unmuted? I saw there was a message that I might be. This is Patrick Clancic. I'm sorry, Ken, could you repeat that for me? Hi, this is Patrick Clancic. Can you hear me? Yes, but uh, it's not the clarity is not the best, which is probably true for my transmissions to you as well. <laughs> so thank you so much, uh, Colonel Schultes, for an excellent, detailed, yet good overview presentation. I really appreciate that. You're and I don't know if it's too specific. My particular role is in the safety and mission assurance realm professionally at the moment. And I know you referenced a NASA manual for flight safety. I have posted a question with some other sources that I'm familiar with, but was wondering if you have any specific references relative to safety and mission assurance in the nuclear realm for flight uh, space hardware. Okay, for uh, uh, radioisotopic power system missions, uh, the launch of those systems, which is relatively straightforward uh, in terms of the issues, is just containment of the radioisotope for a variety of potential accident environments that might occur for an accident, critical accident situation. Uh, those uh, are available. LASIP code is a code that was produced using government funds. And it is an available code that Sandia National Laboratory controls. So it can be uh, acquired and made available as needed. Uh, and it's uh, supportive phenomenological individual codes for determining response for the different environments are also part of that uh, code suite, okay? Now for reactor systems, uh, there is no explicit code, okay, that's been developed to date. There have been proposed safety guidelines identified which involve those operational restrictions and design restrictions to avoid the nasty inadvertent criticality and return of a hot reactor to the uh, uh, biosphere or atmosphere of Earth. And it also, at the tail end, talks about you need to plan for ultimate disposal of a reactor system returning to the vicinity of Earth. Um, I would point you in the interim to the National Security Presidential Memorandum Number 20, which was issued in August of 2019. It has some generic criteria for uh, reactor systems. It identifies that the probability of an intermittent criticality is to be less than 10 to the minus sixth. 
and that uh, if it are different also kind of triggers for the level of launch approval required, depending upon how successful you are in design and demonstration, both validation by, by testing, benchmark testing, as well as analysis of what the probability and the consequences might be for a launch accident. The distribution of materials, the land contamination, air contamination, the potential for uh, an inadvertent criticality and its associated consequences to the local vicinity as well as to the public. Uh, and for the potential for in-space uh, disruption of a space reactor because of overpower or undercooling events that might occur. And uh, so operational in-space systems, which ITGs really don't have to deal with yet. Okay. That's the best that I can do for you, but there are folks working at a variety of institutions. Uh, and where are you from, uh, Patrick? I'm in Southern California, and I work at a company that manufactures components uh, for space uh, uh, vessels. We had uh, things on the sky crane, in fact, for the Mars landers. And, and this is very exciting to hear you and see some of these pictures. But I'm in Southern California, Los Angeles area. OK. Well, you do know that DARPA wants to fly a nuclear thermal propulsion platform uh, as a demonstration in cislunar space. So they are leading, if you will, the charge here in terms of environmental protection uh, analyses, as well as safety analyses that will have to be conducted in both, you know, going forward with their design, as well as analyzing the consequences, you know, the various accidents that might have during launch or the potential for a, a re-entry of a cold system back into the Earth's atmosphere. I don't think, hopefully they will put in place operational requirements that will never allow a hot uh, reactor to come anywhere near the Earth's atmosphere in the future. So they, they are one source. NASA is another. Both Marshall Space Flight Center, as well as the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and their contractors, uh, BWXT and uh, Aerojet Rocketdyne and General Atomic, all our contractors to either DARPA as well as uh, 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 NASA. And Lucky Martin and Blue Origin are involved in the DARPA side, so they too are involved. And in fact, Lockheed Martin was uh, involved in the first development of the LASIK program in its early stages before it was transitioned to Sandia National Labs. Hope that helps. Yes, thank you very much. Anything else? Yeah, <clears throat> if you, uh, so Carlo, actually, uh, Mr. Stan, uh, Stan uh, Rosen has a question about the report. Uh, Stan, do you want to speak out? Yeah, okay, thanks. <clears throat> Joe, great uh, presentation. Thanks very much. That was a <clears throat> wonderful summary. The note I put. I'm sorry, you broke up. I lost you. Okay, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, I was just trying to find the report that you referred to from the National Academy. Uh, and I had heard some rumors about it, and now I found it, and I just want to read it. Yeah, I guess one of the questions was, it seems counterintuitive to me to use a nuclear electric system for crewed transportation to Mars. Is that a, a valid rumor or is that- uh, is Well, you'll see that- Just for cargo. The nuclear electric propulsion option involves a, a chemical propulsion system to get away from the Earth's uh, gravity well first and to get away from Mars gravity well on the return as well. So you get up to a reasonable uh, velocity before uh, the NEP system can augment that velocity with its lower, very low thrust, but over a longer period of time. Okay, that's the difference between NEP and NTP. NEP is three farts per fortnight and NTP is large thrust 
in short duration for hours, whereas NEP can operate for years. The challenges are for demonstrating and maturing the technologies for each in the available time. And in terms of NTP, it basically, that challenge is, is within the reactor itself and the high temperatures involved to acquire high ISPs on the order of 3,000 degrees Kelvin. And so you're talking about temperatures that only a few materials can endure for any length of time. And it's important to develop those uh, in the short term and validate their lifetime, if you will. Uh, for NEP, and also on NTP is uh, the supply and, and uh, continued supply without losses of cryogenic hydrogen uh, over the duration of a Mars mission, be it cargo or crew mission. That's a real, uh, if you will, difficult challenge uh, to, to overcome. The other is associated with the startup of nuclear thermal rockets. In order to have an IISP, an effective IISP, you need to start these things up within 30 to 60 seconds. And that is a very challenging uh, accomplishment, given that you are uh, pushing liquid hydrogen into a system and it has positive reactivity worth uh, as it's injected into a reactor system that's already operating at power. Uh, to generate in, in, you know, in the phase change of liquid hydrogen into gaseous hydrogen and heating it to the point where it will give you substantial thrust as it expands through a nozzle. On the NEP side, the challenges are not so much on the reactor side because the, the temperatures are much lower. They're in the order of 1200 degrees Kelvin to 1350 Kelvin max. Uh, the challenges are in terms of the energy conversion system and its lifetime and reliability and the electric propulsion system scale up from at most seven kilowatts electric today to probably a hundred kilowatts electric needed for a true NEP platform. Otherwise you would have hundreds and hundreds of EP thrusters on this platform. And that's a tremendous complexity for a PMAD system to have to work with. Hope that helps. Yeah, thanks, Joe. And I'll read the report. I appreciate you uh, working on it and pointing us in that direction. Okay. I'll let the report speak for itself. Uh, I, I'm only one of the 11 members of that study uh, panel, but the report speaks for itself. Anything else? Yeah, yeah. We, we have actually several questions. Um, How much the... time do we have, Ken? Um, don't worry. If we have time, we can continue. Do you have time? Okay, I have time. Okay. The people are very enthusiastic. So, um, Mr. Bill, Bill Kelly is here. Bill, do you want to say something? Say a few words? Uh, thanks for the opportunity, Ken. Uh, I think the Dr. Uh, Schultz said it all. I just keep... The, the point you seemed passionate about once in your speech was how uh, not... Uh, um, how, how when you deal with uh, with uh, radioisotope uh, um, uh, decay versus fission, um, and you said that uh, lo long half life uh, long half life uh, uh, materials have no um, uh, are not uh, very radioactive. I think a point comes out if you do the math, right? If you uh, differentiate an expression for energy and get power, you wind up with uh, half-life in the denominator of the expression, which tends to uh, uh, reduce the, uh, which makes you want to use low half-life uh, materials for uh, for power generation. Isn't that isn't that you know what I'm talking about, right? Yes, I do. For for RTGs, if you have short life overall, higher density, uh, higher power density, and shorter half life radioisotopes can be utilized. In right. fact, the United Kingdom is using Amalitium 241 
which has, you know, it's slightly lower. It's 432 years, I think, half-life right. for Elysium 241. But you could go to uh, alpha emitters. I would not go to beta emitters because they mm -hmm. create issues uh, of secondary heating and gammas associated with them. Uh, so, so strontium-90, I probably would not recommend. Uh, utilization, but polonium 210 could could be used. It has been used by the Russians. Yeah, polonium uh, gets past. used by the Russians to poison their enemies too, right? Uh, well, I'm not going to comment on anything political today. But, <laughs> right. uh, the the half-life of polonium 210 is 138 days, as I recall, something like that. Right. And so, you know, if you go out uh, between five and ten half-lives, you've lost a lot of right. its potential. Uh, electrical energy if you're going to convert it into electric power using thermal electrics. So that's the downside of using uh, shorter half-life materials. It, 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 but you're right about the case for reactors versus RTGs. I am passionate about that because I believe that there is a, a group of people out there who believe that, geez, we've flown uh, all these RTGs, and we had the potential for one to, during Cassini, to re-enter and spew all of its material at high altitude during the Earth, uh, close Earth flyby, uh, where it could have potentially burned up because it was going at Mach, equivalent of Mach 57, okay, at that time. But uh, let me tell you, the JPL used extraordinary measures to ratchet that trajectory in very slowly and gave up fuel in doing so, propellant for the spacecraft in doing so, to ensure that the probability of a re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere was 10 to the minus seven. Okay? Yeah. All right. Now, if you talk about comparing RTGs to reactors, in one, you have a source term that if released can pro project issues to individuals. It is an alpha emitter. And if it is ground up into small enough pieces and inhaled into the deep lung, it can pose problems to a population that's been exposed. Mm -hmm. In the case of reactors, we're talking about a uranium fueled system that has no fission products within it. It probably only contains three curies, three to 10 curies total mm -hmm. of, of radioactivity from the, you know, the innate U-235 and U-238. And if we use low enriched uranium, as opposed to high enriched uranium, that's even less. So it borders on the three uh, curies for low enriched uranium. Right. But there are issues associated with low enriched uranium right. in terms of ensuring inadvertent criticality. Uh, it's basically associated not just with the enrichment, but with the operating spectrum, neutron spectrum for the reactor. If you're operating a, a high enriched uranium, you would like to operate it at a, with high energy neutrons. Okay, for Rover Nerva, that was not possible because the materials that were available at that time were basically graphite based. Okay, and graphite is a moderator. So it was slowing down those neutrons all the way. So Rover Nerva was an it was really not totally thermalized. It was in an epithermal right. reactor, okay? And if you dunk that thing in water, it will go critical, okay? So you have to do something. And the, the proposed design uh, augmentation was to insert uh, neutron, thermal neutron absorber materials in the form of wires into the core, which would be extracted in space so that you could then go critical above a nuclear safe orbit mm. and go on your way. Mm. That's one approach, but it's not the only approach. Burnable poisons could be used. You could make a very, very robust structure where you lock the control elements in place such that the accident environments can't tear them away or disturb them, or the pressure vessel is so robust that you cannot compress the system uh, in an accident, severely. So there are other approaches. I don't want to try to design the system. I just functionally want to say that we want it to avoid inadvertent criticality. And DSPM says 
10 to the minus six guys, you meet that and we'll fly. Right. Okay. And Thanks, don't sir. ever bring one back. We don't want to see the yeah. hot reactor return to the vicinity of Earth. Period. Right. Bad news. Yeah, thanks for that. My uh, my history with uh, nuclear uh, is I worked in the nuclear industry for like 15, 20 years at Babcock and Wilcox. I also uh, was on the MMRTG team at Rocketdyne to uh, put together the first MMRTG for Curiosity. I was on the Boeing Rocketdyne team for right. the MMRTG at that time. And, and one last, I guess, statement on my, this is my perspective. I believe there's a group of folks out there uh, and you can put whatever label on them you want, but they believe that flying reactors is much more difficult than flying isotopic powered missions. And that's simply not true, okay? You're starting with a lower inventory and you can protect that if you do things smartly along the way. You got me sold, you gotta sell those other guys though, right? <laughs> well, I don't know. We'll see. You know, we'll the decision see. maker is is the ultimate determining factor. Right. Thank you for that. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Bill. This is wonderful. Uh, Pankaj has a question. So, Pankaj, do you want to speak out? Oh well, uh, the, the, my, uh, my only question was, you know, whatever is written is how is the risk assessed or simulated? I'm sorry, I was away uh, for a while, so I probably missed something for the past ten minutes. Yeah, I think you probably missed the uh, the answer I gave to the chat question. I'm so sorry, actually. <laughs> Unfortunately, I had to. And, and to, I guess I actually augmented that also uh -huh. with the discussion to the first question on oh. code availability in their development for. Mm -hmm for isotopic systems and the lack of one that exists today, but the development of which is underway, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. oh. Okay, so, okay. Thank and you. this is being reported, so it may be available to you. Yeah, 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 sure, sure, thank you. Is it possible to ask my question? Certainly. Michelle, okay. Michelle, go ahead. Yes, hi, this is Michelle Asher Memory. Um, and I had a question about because the future is, or in space is going to be requiring more and more high power systems. Specifically, my question is in regards to nuclear electric propulsion. Given that the conversion efficiency is about 25 to 30 at its current state, um, our heat rejection requirements are so high. And then we have this problem with the heat rejection. You need the, the higher the temperature, the smaller the area and so forth. So then right. a, a large portion of the mass fraction is the radiator for this type of system. That's in the 19, true. Yeah, in the 1980s, I've um, done a lot of research in this. Um, they experimented with something called a liquid droplet radiator as a yes, solution. Those, those, and I was wondering um, if you knew about that or what happened and whether they actually did do the test for the space shuttle or not. Uh, I don't know if they actually did test. Those tests were done in conjunction with a program called the multi-megawatt yeah. reactor power program, which was in support of actually powering the weapons in space for the strategic defense initiative. And things like the liquid droplet radiator involved consumables. You know, it's a phase change. Are you taking advantage of a phase change material? And, but it is, because it's consumable, it's not gonna last forever. And so it's a limited life system that you only engage when needed, okay? Now, whether they were tested benchmark here on earth, I do not know. Can't well, what I've read is actually, they are not phase changing because they use very low vapor pressure materials. So depending on the temperature range, they would either use like silicon oils or metals uh, for, for other ones. But the idea is it, it, there's not much loss. As a result, okay. what they do is they, they release these droplets and a collector will collect them yeah, and they recycle correct. it back. You're correct. If you have a, a, a low vapor pressure medium, cool, I guess, basically, because you're going to utilize, and you create small spheres, which are then have high surface to volume ratio, you can carry much more energy away and collect it at the other end. Uh, I think the question about collection efficiency would come to mind, you know, in my mind, at the top of my head, but I do not know 
uh, how that was proceeded in advance. And I'm not aware of documents that are readily available to answer your the, question. All the documents are from the 80s. The last one being 1989. One of, which, one of which one of which referred to the space shuttle um, experiment that no one seems to know whether it actually happened or not. It may be that it's export controlled or uh, classified. You know, there are different labels on things out there other than a strict classification uh, under DOE. Uh, requirements or from a national security standpoint. Yeah. I can't answer that question. I'm unaware of it uh, because I was un not involved. Uh, I know who the program manager was for that program at DOE at the time when I was running the SB100 program. And I knew that they were looking at very exotic ways to, uh, for thermal management, let's call it that, removal yeah. of heat and thermal management. Uh, and, and very difficult, very difficult uh, engineering aspects associated with that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mr. Stephen Schreier has a couple of questions. So, Steve, do you want to go ahead? Go ahead, Steve. Hmm. Yes, I was wondering about the... Uh, uh, a possible assembly of any of these nuclear uh, systems uh, aboard the internet, the small ones on in space itself. In other words, take the components that might be hazardous to launch as a complete unit from Earth in a rocket and instead send them modularly up to the International Space Station or something similar where they could be put together up there and then uh, integrated into a probe or whatever. Thank you. Yeah, the, pro the problem is for, on the reactor side that the minimum critical mass is very, very small for reactors. And if you can, if, if you can create the external environment for reflecting neutrons back into the system, as well as geometric changes uh, to uh, compress that mass, you can actually achieve criticality. So launching things separately is not... <laughs> It, it, it really doesn't solve the problem. And then assembly and welding, uh, you know, a system in space is, is very, very difficult on its own. So those manufacturing technologies, at least in the near term, should probably best remain on Earth and fly a system that already is designed to remain subcritical and not uh, spew materials out during known launch accidents and accident environments is probably required anyway. If, if you're talking about an isotopic system, you would have to have containment of that as well. So why not just have the generator with its you know, intrinsic containment launched? Because I hope that answers your question. Yes, it, it, it does. It, it, it's really difficult to launch subcritical amounts of materials and then assemble them in space without facing similar problems during launch for those smaller pieces. Yes, that's, that's good to know. I mean, it's a very complex thing and most people, even myself, not being a physicist, you know, uh, uh, learning how this is done is just extraordinary. And uh, obviously the amount of science by the pioneers in this on, for the Voyager probes, I mean, that's, that's simply amazing to me, uh, the kind of research that's out there that you're doing that, uh, probably most folks really don't understand the complexity of this. They just think, well, the Mars Perseverance rover is there and it's running on nuclear power. And they just look at, at that as it is, but they don't realize the science and the you know, tremendous number of hours and years of research that goes into this. And one quick question, do you know if, and I'm just curious, this is, if any of the Apollo uh, moon, uh, you know, the things that were left on the moon, if they're still running, if any of that is still running, uh, no, they've all been, the missions have been terminated. The, uh, uh, the SNAP 27s that are there, they've been there since the 60s. So they're, they're 60 years old and they're reaching their, their half-life, if you will. And so a, a 40 watt electric system at best, if the thermal electrics are still uh, pristine and operational, would be on the order of 10 watts electric maximum. So, plus there's degradation of, of the thermal electrics. That's what I'm saying. There's the decay 
of the isotope plus a, plus a degradation of the thermoelectrics that is involved over time. So they may be still putting out thermal energy and to some extent electrical energy, but it may not be very useful. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, uh, Michelle, raise, uh, raise hands again. So Michelle, do you want to say something? Yes, uh, I just had one more question, if I may. Based, I wanted to ask your opinion on nuclear thermal rockets. Which do you think would be the logical way to go, Surser or Sermit? I don't think, you know, I, those are two of a variety of options. I think there is also an option involving legacy fuel. Going back to the graphite composite fuel fuel that was used during Rover Nova. If you, you'll notice that the phase diagram for that particular fuel form, which uh, involved at that time, uh, I think the fuel loading was on the order of 600 kilograms per cubic, cubic meter. At that, at that fuel loading, the, um, uh, the melting point for the fuel was on the order of 24 to 2500 degrees Fahrenheit, mm -hmm. which can't deliver. Uh, 750 or certainly not 900 seconds of ISP. Uh, but if you reduce, can reduce that fuel loading down to about 200 to 250 uh, kilograms per cubic meter, the melting point of that fuel goes up to 3,100 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, the operational point for, for an ISP of 900 seconds is like 2,900 degrees Kelvin. Yeah. So it, it is possible that you could have a 200 degree Kelvin margin using legacy fuel if you do it smartly. In Even terms of Surser versus Surmet, I, I, really, I really don't, you know, in my mind, those are more robust uh, fuel forms and I think they should be pursued, but I'm not sure that that's the good enough answer to make it in the 2030s for nuclear thermal propulsion. That's my personal opinion. Okay. Okay. You'll not see that in that report, by the way. Yeah, yeah. We, didn't, we did not get down to that level of detail. Because I, I'm a huge supporter of CERMIT fuel, because I think it has a very high, like the GE 710 program. Uh, right. those, had, those had really interesting data that we should pursue, I think, for the future, and you eliminate having to use the moderators, so reducing significant amount of well, weight. But that, that but then your uranium loading is pretty high. Now you're talking about a, a fast spectrum system. Correct. Which almost demands a HEU fuel yes. uh, reactor. Otherwise, it will be huge. Yeah. Okay, so if you can fly HEU, if you can make the case for HEU, and a fast spectrum system, I agree with you, that's a pathway to nuclear thermal propulsion. Yeah. Okay, you can't go thermal because if it, if it has tungsten in it, tungsten has a thermal absorber cross-section yeah. that shuts you down. Agreed. Okay, Thank you so hope much. that helps. Thank you. Okay, Re Rex has a question. Rex, go ahead. Yeah, hi there. Um, I was curious, uh, you mentioned on Cassini there were 117 RHUs placed all yeah. over the spacecraft. Was there, a, was there a safety issue with putting those on the spacecraft early, you know, before system test, or were they put in late like the larger RTGs, you know, at the launch site or something? Uh, in comparison to the, the three GPHS RTGs that were flying on Cassini, those 117 watt, one watt systems were almost a hiccup, okay? And they have been uh, tested extensively for overpressure, impulse, impacts, shrapnel bullets fired at them, not just the overall uh, system, you know, with the aeroshell, but also at the clads themselves, and they survive. These systems are very robust against very severe accident environments that can occur. Where they are uh, susceptible to failure is by virtue of a little bit of 
deterioration due to one and then hit, getting hit with another one. And then perhaps having to survive a 10 minute celloplatonic trial that burns at 3000 degrees Kelvin. I mean, that's a severe environment. But that likelihood of that happening is less than 10 to the minus three. But to get a 10, 10 minute duration fire means a full web thickness of three feet, approximately one meter chunk being next to you and burning for 10 minutes. So it has to happen, the accident has to happen close into the pad and everything has to break up such that you have you know, a full web thickness of solid propellant lying next to you for, and burns for 10 minutes. Right. Okay. Well, yeah, so I was curious, when in the spacecraft assembly sequence were those mounted to the spacecraft? You know, I don't know. Idaho National Lab could probably answer that question. They have the responsibility mm. for assembling, transporting, and integrating the hardware at the Cape. Okay. Okay. You think it, you think it might have been at the Cape for those RHUs even? I believe so, yes. Oh, okay. Thank I you. doubt that they would have trans transported the spacecraft with those ruse on board. Okay. Okay, uh, GR has two questions, so GR, go ahead. Hi, right, thank you. Uh, two questions, not necessarily related, and uh, some of the discussion has maybe answered a little bit about it, uh, a little bit about them. Uh, the first one was availability of special nuclear material uh, for future nuclear power systems, I'll say particularly RTGs, although I think you've kind of hinted at the fact that there's a number of different options there, but there's been you know, quite a bit of speculation about the availability from DOE of the materials in order to go ahead and support RTGs. I was curious if you'd comment on that. And then the second question, not related, you showed a list of the Cosmos uh, reactors that were flown with the radar uh, imaging satellites, and I didn't see on there uh, Cosmos 1818, which was one of the Topaz one reactors that appeared to have a coolant leak uh, several years post-mission after disposal, and some of the uh, sodium potassium coolant appears to have leaked out. Yes, now, there, you're comment. correct. There is one system in space. It's either, uh, you know, the, the one from Cosmos okay, 1818, or I can't remember the numbers, uh, but they're on the slide. Uh, one slide that talks about uh, the Book reactor and the Topaz reactor. Uh, the Topaz 1 uh, system was uh, basically an in-core thermionic system that utilized MAC cooling, and it may be the one that leaked. No one knows where which one is actually expressing uh, the MAC uh, eutectic coolant. Uh, into a lower Earth orbit. It's actually a higher Earth orbit uh, in space. Uh, one right after this one came. Or is it before? I think it's right after that one that you're showing. But you are right in terms of uh, protection of materials that are that remain and are operated in Earth orbit is certainly an issue. If it has the potential to have an impact on other uh, space assets or the biosphere, both of those need to be addressed. Uh, yes, it's it's either before or after this slide came. I, I, it, I don't know if it's if it was this one or not. I, I, I just, I bring it up. It's as much an issue relative to exactly. recreation as anything. Um, as we've seen with battery failures on a number of uh, different satellites that, you know, then- well, that system was, the, yeah. the Topaz systems that were flown, Topaz 2 was never flown. Topaz 1 was, okay? And uh, and it it was designed for 90-day life, maximum, in our view. And that's true for the book reactors as well. This was a demonstration, quick, Dirty demonstration of infrathermionics, and I think they also had tied it to electric propulsion. Okay, it's it's got the Russian hardware pictures on it. Uh, Ken, this is the slide we're looking for. <clears throat> now, to answer your other question about availability of plutonium two thirty eight, uh, I was on a National Academies committee 
uh, and the report actually uh, recommended the restart of plutonium-238 production in the United States. And it took several years until motion actually happened. But in fact, when we delivered that report uh, openly to the public, DOE requested in that year's budget money to start that process. And they were told by Congress, no, it will not be DOE, it will be the user who pays for this. And it went into kind of a black hole for several years until that policy remained and NASA now has to fund DOE to produce plutonium-238. And they're doing it at the uh, high flux isotope reactor at Oak Ridge and the advanced test reactor at Idaho. They're producing, or I guess they're up to about, uh, I think by 2023 or 2024, they are supposed to have a production capability of one and a half kilograms per year. Now that would be sufficient for the kinds of missions that I've shown here. Yeah, this is the, the one. Down at the bottom, you'll see, well, it's actually the bullet right here. Two were Topaz-1, Topol, in core thermionic reactor system, the five kilowatts the Cosmos 1818 and Cosmos 1867, okay? Those are the systems that were flown, the in core thermionic system that were flown by the Russians. Topaz-2 was an academic reactor. We purchased a Topaz-2 reactor on fuel and used an electrical heater here in Albuquerque to understand its characteristics. And the Air Force actually wanted to fly a modified Topaz-2 for what was called the Nuclear Electric Propulsion Space Test Project. And this was in the 91-92 1991 92 that that project was initiated. And we into a wise uh, in panel for that mission, and we had one meeting uh, with the NAP STP folks, and we identified functionally what needed to be done to modify the system in order to have any hope of flying it. I understand that there were so many single point failures in that design. And the modifications to actually meet safety requirements for so the year, but it would have been easier to go back and start from scratch when that project was done. Anyway. Hope that helps. That's my understanding. That, that, that was very interesting for that clarification. Anything else? Yeah, yeah. Um, Mr. Michel Akula from France. He's a retired Air, uh, French Air Force officer and a science writer. He has some questions. Michel, go ahead. Lots of Michelle's in the crowd. Yeah. <clears throat> they are different, though. <clears throat> uh, so, sorry, Ken, me, me Mister. Um, uh, my English is very poor. Sorry. Uh. I, I can't uh, go, go to speak. I, I'm French. I'm going to try anyway. You know, I, I can't. I can't uh, speak uh, speak American. Sorry, very very sorry. I have a translator. Yes, <laughs> to 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 write my question, but uh, no no more. Sorry. If you, to, if you go to my website, okay, you can communicate by email to me direct, and you know, cast your question and. Uh, Hopefully it can be translated into English and I don't have to translate from French to English, but we'll manage to answer your question in some way, somehow, okay? Uh, no worry, I, I'll read his questions. Oh, okay, um, cool. The first one is, what do you think about plasma propulsion? And I thank you for your very interesting presentation. That is a, it's a, it's a timely question, actually, because there is a, uh, a researcher at uh, the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory, the name is Fatima Ibrahimi, who is developing the plasma physics uh, <coughs> system, which utilizes what she characterizes as plasmas, which are created as a result of magnetic reconnection. Now, if any of you have seen uh, a, a, a mass ejection from the sun, Occur photographically, you'll notice that the velocity of that 
mass ejection is tremendous in relationship to the normal speeds that we are used to, you know, 5 to 20 uh, kilometers per second. These can be upwards and included as much as 500 kilometers per second. Okay? Now, if she is successful in producing, sustaining, and controlling the creation of these plasmoids by controlling magnetic reconnection, she's got a win. And it doesn't mean that you have to uh, uh, reach uh, fusion conditions, you know, you know break even fusion. This is just the creation of a hot plasma that you can control. Now that's going to take electric power in and of itself. Okay? And so this is probably going to be, if it's successful, a hybrid system, which is probably nuclear to produce the electricity to create the plasma with a magnetic you know, environment on board uh, that produces the plasma which provides the primary threats for the plasma. Does that answer your question? Colonel, my respect, and thank you for this super presentation. Ibrahimi. And she just came out with a paper uh, last fall, I believe. Very interesting paper. And she was at the Nuclear and Emerging Technologies for Space Conference and gave a talk there also. That was held just a month ago. Uh, it, was, it was virtually held, hosted by the International Laboratory. Uh, and they recorded and kept the uh, archives of all papers in the time. Yeah, okay. uh, Michelle also has another question. Does the arrow behind you, <clears throat> behind you fly past March 20? I think you're referring to the, <clears throat> what was the picture in your- Oh, the picture that's wall. behind my- it's, it's an arrow, I think it's the yeah, <clears throat> upright. A, it's a, a new view of propulsion. Yeah, it's a picture to with the SP-100 ground engine system plus fortune. How we were going to do that as well as the integrated flux assembly. Okay, because we required to make electric propulsion. And going from the reactor, fuel, energy conversion, heat removal, we, we didn't want to have to create the whole system in its entirety. That's huge. In a, in a vacuum chamber, that means it's probably in a kind of chamber. So you would do the reactor test in a vacuum chamber by itself. And you would do the other subsystem test equally in vacuum, vacuum systems all the way. But in one test for the integrated assembly chamber, we could go from the power conversion system all the way out to heat ejection, thermal management, PMAD, to one panel of the radio. That was proposed to protect the system. We never did either of those tests, the ground engineering system test or the integrated assembly. We thought basically the Soviet Union broke up and there was no need for this system. Now, SP 100 continued, but they ratcheted back the power levels to try to find an existing customer or mission, but none came forward, unfortunately. Hope that helps. Yeah, that's a uh, uh, Pratik said he uh, helped trans translate for you if you need it. Uh, but but uh, Michelle has a question, but I'm not so sure what he meant. He said there's he has a question about the uh, efficiency. Uh, is a uh, efficiency for what he was trying to ask for, but I don't know what he meant. Well, I, I can talk to SP100 views thermal Prometheus and Jimmo were going to use the ground selected for gas cooled reactor <clears throat> and tied it directly to a rotating Britain uh, unit, multiple rotating Britain units for power production. The efficiency of those systems is 20 to 25 percent uh, as an individual great located unit in a system that might drop a bit. And there were multiple units provided for the city government uh, to help ensure a longer life. Hope that helps. 
Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, the next question will be from Ravi. Uh, Ravi, you go ahead. Mr. Deepak. Well, if it doesn't, all right, all right, let me, if it doesn't speak, I'll read it for him. It's appreciate for the presentation. This uh, Dragonfly is very exciting and a great overview. And what would happen with solar events like a uh, Cariton with in-space nuclear? And what are, you, what, what are your thoughts on fusion? I keep hearing it's 10 years out. <laughs> That's the joke, okay? The oh, okay. fusion is always 20 years away. But it started, you know, it started making the case that we're 20 years away in the late 60s and early 70s. And we, we haven't achieved it yet. What's happening in the UK right now is very exciting. Uh, we've discussed the cosmic physics and the potential for fusion and extracting the heat from a fusion reactor. We'll see what actually happens. But uh, <coughs> the controllability, the long term controllability of the plant is, is an issue with magnetic component fusion. Yeah, and uh, the next question from Pratik. Pratik, I think you, you, you can speak out. Do you, let me see, Pratik. Go oh, ahead, Pratik. Maybe, let me, let me do it here. You may have dropped out. No, 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 he's here. Pratik, go ahead. Hello, oh, sir. Uh, uh, thanks. Oops, sorry. I interrupted you. That was never my point. Please complete your thought so that I can uh, ask you a question. Yeah, I think he's, he's, uh, that's all his question. So, so I think it should be. Okay. Is okay, go can, ahead. We've rounded up. How wonderful. It, it certainly took longer than I thought it was going to take. Mostly because, unfortunately, the technical issues we had at the front end, and perhaps I didn't, I didn't experience them. You all may have experienced. The problem with uh, uh, with my microphone, and I apologize for that. Uh, but there's nothing I could do. Anyway. But I do understand that uh, Ken is going to have this recorded, and it will be made available through the AAA OA and LD uh, website. So, for something else, I thank you very much for your attention, and uh, onward and upward. Oh, I see. I see. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel. Sorry, uh, I misunderstood. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank yeah. you for the time. And uh, we will kind of extend it a bit longer, but I think it's a great opportunity. So it's our great pleasure and honor. So welcome to come back anytime. So if anything, let us know. Okay. Highly appreciate it. So Highly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Um, thanks for your time, Colonel. Take care. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you for joining us today. Stay in touch. And uh, the recording will be posted and the kernel also approved. We can share the slide. So it will be posted as well. So really appreciate it. So look, look, uh, look forward to seeing you in an uh, coming, uh, in upcoming LW Los Angeles that's record section event. Appreciate it. Have a good, good day. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Right. Awesome. Uh, and can I also request you for sharing the recording because there were some issues at my end and I wasn't able to. Oh yeah, uh, I, I already mentioned the recording will be posted after the event. Okay, awesome. Thanks All a right. lot. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hope everyone have a nice weekend. Take care. Take care.